How was your flight? Oh, it was very nice, thank you. Yes. I got a little reading in. And... Oh, did you? <laughs> I don't know, airplane food. I'm not sure about the meals. <laughs> Thank Mr. You. Gordon, I'm glad you could have a chance to see this. I've been wanting you to look at it for some time. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting artifact. Okay, let's see what you have for me. There's a point of reference for you. Here she is. All right. Now, I've had a hard time with that inscription. It's got some familiar characters, but... Where was this found? This was in the Bat Creek uh, area, the mounds in Tennessee. And uh -huh. it was an official dig by the Smithsonian. So it was an official dig? In, in 1889, yes. Oh. And, uh, well, what do you think it is? They've termed it and labeled it as uh, Paleo Cherokee. Well, I have news for you. This is not Cherokee. This is Hebrew. When you peel back the pre-Columbian history of the United States, you might just find the Book of Mormon. Hidden in the Heartland. Firm Foundation President Rod Meldrum takes us to a little known archaeological site in New Mexico. Sitting here on Hidden Mountain, just outside of Las Lunas, New Mexico, where we're in front of the Las Lunas Decalogue Stone. It's called the Decalogue Stone because it has the Ten Commandments written in an ancient Hebrew script. This Hebrew script was actually first learned about through Professor James Tabor of the University of North Carolina when he was interviewing the late Professor Frank Hibben. And Frank Hibben actually had been taken out here with a guide in the 1880s, and uh, the inscription actually predates the arrival of any of the European explorers that came to America. Archaeolinguist Cyrus Gordon suggests that the script is taken from the Samaritan alphabet, a descendant of the Paleo-Hebrew alphabet. So we have different locations with ancient Hebrew writing on it. The significance of that cannot be understated because of the fact that in the Book of Mormon, they talked about their language was primarily Hebrew. The plates that the Book of Mormon was written on, the gold plates, those had a language which was called Reformed Egyptian. But Moroni actually lamented, he actually said, if we could just write in Hebrew, there would be no imperfections in my record. One of the earliest recorded examples of Hebrew found in America goes back to 1815 in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Joseph Merrick Esquire, a respectable member of a local church, was leveling some ground in a place called Indian Hill. There, he found a thick black strap made of rawhide. There was a loop on each end, possibly made for the purpose of being carried. Inside the strap were four folded leaves of old parchment. The leaves were dark yellow and contained some kind of writing. The items were taken to Cambridge University, where it was determined they were Hebrew writings of Bible verses from Exodus and Deuteronomy. This event was recorded in a book called View of the Hebrews, written in 1825 by author Ethan Smith, pastor of a church in Pulteney, Vermont. In his book, Smith makes the case that the Native Americans of North America could be part of the lost tribes of Israel. An example of the possible Egyptian influence in North America is located in the state of Tennessee. During the Depression years, Norris Basin in eastern Tennessee was about to be flooded for the construction of a new dam. But before the flooding, an archaeological study was done and published by the Smithsonian. They recorded evidence of an ancient civilization consisting of 23 sites. There were 29 mounds, half of them burial mounds. Also 54 wooden structures, most of which had fallen apart, being reduced to charcoal. We've got uh, Egyptian coming out of Tennessee, which is really marvelous, simply because it was a site done by Smithsonian and archaeologists together. 
So it was a regular dig. It, it wasn't handled by, uh, you know, amateurs. And uh, as they uncovered this mound, there was actually three mounds, one on top of the other. Uh, two, the first two layers were all Mississippian, which is 900 to about 1400 AD. They found small structures in Hopewell Mounds called charnel houses, where they prepared the dead, and then they would burn them, and the bones would be reposited there, sometimes just cremated layers of ash, sometimes whole bodies. But the charnel houses are a normal thing because they're small. But this was a very large structure. It actually had stones inside, uncut stones. They were natural stones. Uh, they were broken down into piles. We could assume they were made into some type of receptacle, perhaps an altar. But they were confused in what they found. This archaeological survey caught the attention of British curator and biblical scholar J. Rendell Harris. Rendell Harris, who was an Egyptologist of the day, out of England, was involved with the dig uh, to examine, to tell what he sees because of his expertise. And when he saw these things in the dig, plus when he found out all of the Native American names around that area in Tennessee, he just said there was Egyptian presence everywhere in the names, like Swanee and, and Sycamore, and even Tennessee itself. Tennessee is an Egyptian name by his interpretation. Uh, it means land of Isis. Tenna, land of Essi, means Isis. Harris wrote a number of essays entitled The Afterglow Essays. Here, he makes the case that there was an Egyptian influence in Tennessee and that this archaeological site did indeed contain an Egyptian temple. One thing is for certain, Tennessee does maintain a hint of Egyptian influence throughout the state. In Veracruz, Ohio, stands the Holy Ghost Parish Cemetery that is home to a number of neglected gravestones from the Civil War era. But in the early 19th century, this location was the center of a peculiar site that has some researchers curious of its origin. In the first publication from the Smithsonian in 1848, Ancient Monuments of the Mississippi Valley, Ephraim Squire and Edwin Davis map out hundreds of mounds and earthworks. One in particular was found in the shape of a nine-candle menorah and an oil lamp. Originally printed by the Army Corps of Engineers in 1823, the size of the Hanakia Mound is over 800,000 square feet. Squire and Davis, of all the mounds that they surveyed, uh, the one that really is extremely unusual is the Hanakia Mound. In their day, a lot of people just simply call it the, the, the Jewish Mound, the Hebrew Mound. Uh, because when they realized from the survey was finished, what they're looking at was a huge menorah, a huge candlestick. And then of course, the very top of it is an oil lamp. So how do you explain this? It was being so different when all the others are high math, you have the squares, the circles, and the linears, beautiful work, beautiful things. But the Hanukkah Mount is totally by itself, nothing else like it. Very interesting mound that that was because the controversy that surrounds it. It puts an ancient Hebrew people here in North America before Columbus. And when the explorers or the discoverers found that, of course, it spoke of a earlier ancient people who could have built these. And that presented a problem for them of proof of a prior land claim. And so it was deliberately reduced after it was discovered. On its destruction, the U.S. Army sent the Corps of Engineers over there, uh, early 1900s, and they removed whatever was left from the farming and flattened it, everything. And yet they touched nothing else in the Ohio Valley except that one. In the small town of Coshocton, Ohio, is the Johnson Humrick House Museum, the home of a variety of displays from ancient Native America to the Civil War. One display in particular has set off a firestorm of controversy, known as the Newark Holy Stones. David Wyrick discovered the stones in 1860 in a cluster of Indian mounds near Newark, Ohio. Wyrick, by profession, was a surveyor, and he also happened to love Indian mounds. And of course, where he lived around that area of uh, Newark, Ohio, 
uh, with all the earthworks being there, everybody was digging on the earthworks. Even even on a Sunday afternoon, people would take a fa uh, family picnic, go to the earthworks, sit down, take a shovel, and just start digging a hole. And gonna, what are you, you know, they're looking for whatever they can find. But Weirich took it serious. He picked a burial mound that was outside of the actual Newark earthworks. He did a first dig there, and he found what we call the keystone. Weirich continued digging into the mounds, and he picked one about 12 miles south of Newark. It was called, they called it at that time the Great Stack. At the bottom of the stack, they find, I've heard two accounts, 12 mounds, and I've heard 13 mounds, in a circle, smaller mounds, around a single mound that was bigger. Weirich went for the big one in the center. He digs it out, he gets down to the bottom, he finds an uh, oak sarcophagus. They take the oak lid off, skeleton of a man laying right there, and it was on a, some kind of a platform. They recognized the platform. So they thought, well, maybe there's something below the platform. And going below the platform, that's when they found a stone box. And in that came out the Decalogue stone. The controversy lies in the text on the stones, both written in a block Hebrew writing. One stone, known as the Decalogue stone, has a figure in the middle with the Ten Commandments written all around the stone. On the stone has this depiction of a man in a long flowing robe, and over his head is written in perfectly legible Hebrew the word Moshe, which is Moses. Of course, they didn't know what they had. They couldn't read it. And they got some Jewish people involved, a rabbi, as I understand it. And the rabbi said, I can read this. And when they began the translation of the stone, it came out to be an entire and complete rendition of the Ten Commandments. The second stone, known as the keystone, has writing on all sides of the stone. Translated, it reads, Holy of Holies, King of the Earth the law of God, and the word of God. They look at it, and, now the, and then the guys, they, they bring up the idea, say, well, we can read it. It's correct in what it says, but we've never seen letters written in this fashion. And so they called it block Hebrew because it was very squarish. Right away then, the naysayers got on that and said, well, Weirich must have made it. Well, how did he get out with eight guys helping him dig? Well, because it went down, it took about four days to reach this thing. They said why had to come back at night and he stuffed this thing into the ground so they could discover it the next day. Several years pass, Weirich starts to fold under all the criticism and he takes his own life. He overdoses of laudanum, which you can buy over the counter. He killed himself. That's, that's a sad story, but it's, it's real. Many of these out-of-place archaeological discoveries are generally dismissed, simply because most of them are found accidentally through farming or preparing for expansion. An archaeologist could not possibly be at every discovery in the United States. But one discovery in particular was performed during an official Smithsonian survey under the direction of Cyrus Thomas. It is known as the Bat Creek Stone. When the mound was discovered, it was on Cherokee territory. The Smithsonian does a dig. Uh, the dig, of course, all the digs were under charge of Cyrus Thomas. He was like um, the overseer. But the man doing it was uh, a Mr. Emmert, and Emmert was put in charge. He was the guy really in charge for the digging and the responsibility of everything that was discovered. And when they found, they found a stone under the head of one of the nine bodies that were there, which happens to be this stone right here, which is a very, very nice replica. Once the stone was found and cataloged, the Smithsonian deemed the inscription on the stone, beyond question, letters of the Cherokee alphabet. But it wasn't till the 1960s, when Henriette Mertz and Cyrus Gordon, upon inspecting the stone, noticed it was printed upside down and was in no way Cherokee inscription, but was instead Paleo-Hebrew. He went to the Smithsonian, he looked at this, and he says, this here is, is upside down, this is right side up, and this is a form of Paleo-Hebrew. They had miscategorized it as Paleo-Cherokee, when in fact it's perfectly legible Hebrew, and what it says when it's translated is for the Judeans. Even with him, the leading expert in academia, 
when this stone went back to the Smithsonian to go on display, they put it back upside down and said, Cherokee script. They refused Gordon's work and his interpretation. More curious is the actual translation of the script from Hebrew. It is believed to be the end of a sentence that reads, for the Judeans. There's been over 30,000 stones that have been found that have had Hebrew writing on them, but they were declared as hoaxes and, and fakes and forgeries. And so most of them have been, been discarded. My older brother and my mother said that uh, they had writing similar to the block style Hebrew um, that was anciently all across the country. It's time that the truth about the ancient history of this nation be made known. Over the years, other curious finds have challenged the status quo. The legend of Chief Joseph and his Mesopotamian tablet, the Michigan relics, and the artifacts from the Burroughs Cave. It was about 1982 that Russell Burroughs related that he had been out uh, in the woods and had fallen into uh, a hole in the ground, which was actually a cave and that um, as a result of that, he discovered a lot of artifacts, and um, most of them were inscribed stones, which were either Latin or Hebrew or Greek, There's a, and sometimes kind of a mixture. Different people have uh, had different takes on Russell Burroughs and his artifacts, and, and some have uh, felt that the artifacts were legitimate and uh, represented some sort of ancient culture uh, in the history of America. Others figured that uh, they were just fakes that he had made himself. The Burroughs artifacts were just one more group of artifacts that don't fit the establishment paradigm. And therefore the first reaction is that it must be a hoax because it doesn't agree with the worldview of ancient America that uh, so many people hold. The fascination with these artifacts has definitely led to the possibility of many forges and fakes. But the question remains, can all of these materials be fake? And if they are fake, what purpose did they serve? It's hard to imagine how somebody could have forged and faked 30,000 artifacts and buried them over seven states in, in dozens of counties. Anything that's found here that predates Columbus is considered, well, not real. Uh, fake, fraudulent, uh, someone's playing a trick. But the point is, you know, when the stuff keeps coming up to surface, you've got to stop and take notice. In 1811 and 1812, there was over 2,000 earthquakes. Three of them were over 8.0 magnitude. Whoever used that knew how to cast iron. But we're talking here about a system that made this place sacred 2,000 years ago. The whole 20 acres is a large burial ground. Hidden in the heartland. 